Good morning, everyone watching in North America. Good morning to our audience in Europe. My name is Damon Wilson, Executive Vice President here at the Atlantic Council in Washington. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome you all to our virtual event celebrating Europe Day. I'm particularly pleased that among our guests today, we are welcoming Commission Vice President for promoting our European way of life, our good friend Margaritas Skinas. Uh, Mr. Vice President, welcome. Sorry. Pleased to be here. Thank you for having me, David. Thank you. Thank you for carving out some time to be with us today. Um, I think everybody knows, well, first of all, the actual Europe Day is tomorrow, May 9th, but we've decided to have a head start here in Washington on celebrating an incredible milestone in the transatlantic relationship. This is part of a broader effort here at the Atlantic Council. So we're going to be using today and throughout the year this hashtag USEU at 70, where you can join the conversation today and moving forward. Most of our viewers know that today is also the 75th anniversary of VE Day, where we celebrate the end of the Second World War in Europe. And for some in Europe, this ended the fascist tyranny they faced 75 years ago. For others, it ushered in a new form of communist tyranny. And it was because of the lessons learned at the end of the war in Europe 70 years ago tomorrow that French Foreign Minister Robert Schuman proposed the creation of the European coal and steel community setting into motion the European project that has culminated in the European Union as we know today. The EU has grown in global power and influence since the days of the coal and steel community, but from the very beginning, the United States and the European Union have been political, economic, and security partners of first resort. A strong united European Union is a critical national interest of the United States, and a dynamic transatlantic relationship strengthens both the United States and the European Union. So as the world weather is a tectonic shift amid a global pandemic right now, we're already seeing long-term implications for the global economy, the world order, and the transatlantic community. Here at the Atlantic Council, we are eager to celebrate the achievement of the EU in building a Europe whole, free, and at peace, a goal that has always been at the heart of the Atlantic Council's mission and U.S. grand strategy, especially at another turning point in the transatlantic relationship today. In fact, through former Secretary of State Dean Acheson, who was one of our co-founders, the United States in 1952 was the first non-member state to officially recognize the European coal and steel community. And today, the EU remains at the core of our programming, and the 70th anniversary of the Schuman Declaration is an opportunity to dive deep into the successes of the USEU partnership and to explore solutions to the challenges ahead of us tomorrow in 2020 and the next 70 years together. So in this context, I'm pleased to announce that this is a new series that will be led by our Council's Future Europe Initiative, USEU at 70. And through public and private convenings, publishing op-eds and issue briefs and digital content, we will celebrate 70 years of USEU engagement, and perhaps more importantly, look ahead to the opportunities and challenges that face us this year and beyond. We're committed to building a healthy, strong USEU partnership for the next 70 years. So we've had the opportunity to work closely with the European Commission over the years, and just this year, we've hosted already Commissioner for Trade, Phil Hogan, Commissioner for Home Affairs, Bill Johansson, and we look forward to a virtual town hall conversation coming up with Vice President for Values and Transparency, Vera Jourova, later this month, as well as bestowing our Distinguished Leadership Award to President Ursula von der Leyen in the fall. But we're thrilled today to welcome Commission Vice President for promoting the European way of life, Margarita Skinnis, to officially kick off our series on the US and EU at 70. Vice President Skinnis took up his current position in the commission of President Ursula von der Leyen in December of 2019 after serving as chief spokesperson of the European Commission from 2014 to 2019, and as a deputy director general of the European Commission's Directorate General for Communications between 2015 and 2019. He's also served as a member of the European Parliament for the European People's Party uh, group through the Greek New Democracy Party and held positions in several commission director generals, including transportation, transport and energy, economic and financial affairs, and the Bureau of European Policy Advisors. Um, but most importantly for us, we have found him over the years to be one of the most articulate and effective leaders in Europe. So Vice President Skinas, it's my sincere pleasure to welcome you virtually to the Atlantic Council. We look forward to hosting you in person uh, sometime in the future. And for now, I'm gonna turn the floor over to Benjamin Haddad, who is the 
dynamic director of our Future Europe Initiative to moderate this conversation. And after their conversation, we'll have a terrific roundtable with some fantastic guests that are joining us uh, to unpack the U.S.-EU relationship at 70. Ben, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Damon. And, and hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us here on, on Zoom, on Twitter. Uh, I'm Ben Haddad. I'm the director of the Future Europe Initiative. And thank you, uh, Commissioner Skinas, for uh, joining us today to celebrate Europe Day and the transatlantic uh, relationship. We'll be with you uh, for 15 minutes and then we'll turn to our, our roundtable on the transatlantic relationship. Before I turn to you, uh, Commissioner, just a few ground rules for people who want to follow us on, on Twitter, on social media. You can use the hashtag USEU at 70, hashtag USEU at 70. Uh, and you can also ask uh, questions either by using the uh, Q&A box uh, on Zoom or asking your questions directly to us on Facebook comments or on, on Twitter. Uh, Commissioner Eskinas, great to see you. Thank you uh, so much for joining us. So let, let's start obviously with the, 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 the direct pressing challenge at hand today. We, this, this 17th anniversary comes at a very challenging time for the European Union. Many are talking about uh, divisions and responding to COVID-19. Should, should we be worried about the resilience of the, uh, the EU in this moment? Ben, I think that historically, um, Europe uh, always came out stronger uh, through crisis. Uh, let me put it differently. Probably uh, our DNA is uh, made in a way that uh, needs some, a bit of crisis to keep everybody together. If you look back, uh, when Jacques Delors came in the 80s and launched the single market, he did that after 30 years of total absolute stagnation at the EU level, where nothing had happened since the Treaty of Rome. In the 90s, when we had the food crisis, like the mad cow disease and dioxins, this pushed Europe to have the, the, the best system of food safety in the world. Then in the crisis, the financial crisis and the, the Greek debt crisis, Europe was able to develop instruments like the EFSF, the ESM to cope. So I have no doubt that uh, Europe will come out stronger from, from the pandemics. And I, <laughs> I also say that, uh, you know, uh, one should judge Europe not on how many times it, it faltered, but on how many times was able to stand back on its feet. Yeah, so you say Europe needs crisis to move ahead, to move forward, and will come out stronger of this, uh, from this crisis. I want to ask you, so the, the uh, von der Leyen Commission has uh, started with, with very strong global ambitions, uh, you know, making the case that Europe should reassert power on the world stage and calling itself a geopolitical commission. Can you tell us what that means, a geopolitical commission, and especially what it will mean in the world post-COVID-19? Well, when this new political cycle started in Europe, the, the, the center of gravity of our political program was, of course, uh, the word transition. This was the commission that was supposed to lead the transition towards greener Europe, towards a digital Europe, and towards a, a geopolitical uh, Europe. Uh, this overarching, overarching objective is still there. But after the crisis, there is another word which is emerging uh, that requires attention, and this is the word resilience. Uh, Europe should learn the lessons from this crisis. We should ask ourselves why uh, we cannot manufacture uh, personal protective equipment in Europe anymore, why uh, our industrial model uh, is able not to produce but prefers to import, uh, why. Uh, in key areas like health, education, tourism, where people expect a lot from Europe, the European Union has practically no competence and, and creates this asymmetry of expectations between what people want from Europe and what Europe can deliver. So this quest for, for resilience after the crisis, I think, would have to address all these issues. And, and, and this is to the benefit, to our collective benefit for the future. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned something that's a little lost in the conversation, both sides of the Atlantic, which is that a lot of the issues that we're talking about today, like health, are not a competence of the European Union. And so when, when, when people blame uh, the, the EU, the Commission, for not being reactive, actually, we're very often talking about divisions among member states. Um, this leads me to ask the, the next question. Your uh, portfolio uh, has an interesting title. It's the uh, 
promoting our European way of life. This is an expression actually that's often heard in the United States, I would say even more than, than in Europe, way of life. Uh, how would you define this European way of life? And you've alluded to this in your previous answer. How it, does it need to change or how does it need to be uh, adapted to respond to uh, the current crisis? Well, in a way, this is a new job. Uh, this portfolio, this vice presidency uh, did not exist in the past. And what uh, I think President von der Leyen uh, wanted to combine in this job is what Emmanuel Macron called uh, the Europe that protects and the Europe that empowers. I mean, what does Europe stand for in today's world? We're democracies. The rights of minorities are safeguarded. The role of women is also protected in the family and society in the workplace. We have universal systems for health and education. We are world champions of data protection and human rights. We take care of our elderly. Uh, there is no death penalty. This is the European way of life. This is what makes Europe strong. By no means uh, the European way of life entails the emergence of a homo europeus who uh, thinks the same, acts the same, and, and fights everyone who does not share uh, our values far from us. But we see the European way of life as a springboard, as, as a mirror, if you like, that reflects the diversity and the richness of what our people uh, bring together. And uh, this is what I'm asked to, to defend, protect, and promote, uh, which is a very challenging and, and highly uh, interesting job, I must say. Another challenging issue, obviously, uh, is the transatlantic uh, relationship. You know that we at the Atlantic Council have at the core of our mission the idea that the United States is stronger with its allies. And Damon mentioned in his introduction, Dean Acheson, who is Secretary of State, at the time of the, uh, the Schuman Declaration, uh, was one of the founding members of uh, the, the Atlantic Council. And the United States was the first country to uh, recognize the, uh, the coal and steel community, uh, first non-member uh, to recognize the coal and steel community 70 years ago. Uh, you know, the, I think for a lot of Americans, it's often complicated for a lot of Europeans too, to understand what the European Union is, what, what does it do, why it should be a partner of the United States. You're talking to both an American and a European audience today. We're on VE Day, tomorrow will be Europe Day. Uh, we're at a challenging time for transatlantic relations. How would you uh, explain the importance of the European Union as a partner to an American audience? First, uh, Ben, let me start by uh, congratulating uh, publicly the Atlantic Council for the great work you, you are doing uh, in, in promoting transatlantic relations. We need this uh, now than ever before, I would say. Then on, uh, on the European integration project and how one would explain this to an American audience, I would start by saying that this is... Um, very much uh, reminiscent of the American experience. This is, this is the model. The, the model is what it started with the Declaration of Independence in the States. Here we started with the Schuman Declaration. Uh, 250 years ago in the States, just 70, 75 years in Europe. But we haven't done that badly. Huh? We, we, we have a, the biggest market in the world, the, the better regulated market. We have a system of values and the soft power appeal, which is universally recognized. We have a common currency. We have a bank. We have a court. Uh, we already have pre-federal structures that are more or less, I would say, copied along the model of the American of the American system. But if I were to be asked for 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 three things, why why Europe uh, still matters after these seventy five years? Uh, I think these are obvious. First, because because of our integration, this is the longest period of peace that Europe enjoyed since the Roman times. Our, our fathers and our grandfathers at some point either fought a war or they slept with an arm next to them. Uh, there are now two, three generations of Europeans that we live in peace, and, and this is uh, inestimable. It is precious. The second thing is that we Europeans now uh, have improved our standard of living eight times. We have uh, a, a remarkable increase in our standard of living through this period of 75 years. And thirdly, Europe today 
is how should I put it? Is 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 a beacon of light in a world that is becoming darker. We we stand for liberty, for freedom, for truth, for honesty. We are on the right side of, of history, if you like. So these three <coughs> achievements, these three historical accomplishments must be understood by the American audience because this is in our joint common Western uh, um, framework of values and systems. Yeah, in, in our joint uh, Western framework of values. Thank you so much, Commissioner Skinas, for taking on your busy schedule to join us this morning. Uh, you're a great friend of the Atlantic Council. You can count on us to continue to promote the transatlantic way of life, if you allow me to say it. Uh, and, and we're looking forward to, uh, to seeing you soon in, in Washington. In the meantime, please stay uh, safe and healthy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Merci. Thank you. And, and let's now turn. We have a, a great group of, of, of experts and officials to continue this conversation with us on US-EU 70 years together, the way forward. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by uh, Nathalie Loiseau, a member of the European Parliament, the chairwoman of the Defense and Security Subcommittee at the European Parliament, who was previously the French Minister for European Affairs, by Ambassador Dan Fried, the Wiser Family Distinguished Fellow at the Atlantic Council, and a former U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs and a former ambassador to Poland. I have Dr. Tori Tosig, Research Director of the Project on Europe and Transatlantic Relations at the Belfast Center uh, at Harvard University and a non-resident fellow at uh, the Brookings Institution, and Dr. Anu Bradford, a professor at Columbia University and the author of The Brussels Effect, How the European Union Rules the World, a, book, a great book on, on the EU regulatory power that was uh, published this year. Uh, let me start maybe with you, uh, Nathalie. Uh, we, we heard um, uh, Commissioner Skinas talk about the importance of our common values in the transatlantic relationship. But obviously, we've seen divisions uh, in the transatlantic relationship this, these last few years. Uh, we see divisions within the, the European Union. W what should be our transatlantic priorities coming out of, uh, of this crisis to, to reshape, I would say, uh, our, our institution and our world order in, in the next few months? Well, first of all, uh, hi, Ben, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, to answer your question, what has happened in the last few weeks was uh, transatlantic relations missing in action. Uh, we faced the crisis uh, in a very uh, distanced way. Uh, United States, uh, Europe, uh, we all tried to uh, uh, solve this crisis without almost talking one to another. Uh, there was uh, very li little American leadership, uh, even if uh, the United States chairs the G7 for the time being. Um, and uh, Europe uh, started by being divided. Then it woke up uh, and then it, it is finding its way. Why is it a problem? Uh, first, why uh, should uh, your side of the pound fear a divided and weak Europe. Why wouldn't you benefit from a weak Europe? Uh, simply because um, Europe is your best, the most reliable ally, and maybe, maybe the only one at this moment uh, in history. If we don't want the world to be shaped by uh, China, uh, if we don't want to let Russia keep on with uh, uh, excessive assertiveness, uh, we have to work together, the United States and Europe. And um, Europe means a united Europe. Uh, divided uh, member states will not be up to the challenge of China, of Russia, and of what we are facing together. So yes, indeed, we have to do more. We have to wake up. We have to reinvent a, for a form of oh, this gross word of multilateralism, which is not very uh, fashionable uh, right now uh, in Washington. Uh, maybe not the old style multilateralism. I will not praise United Nations for what they are, but I would not turn my back and say that we don't need them anymore. We have to fix what doesn't work uh, instead of breaking things even more than we've done uh, so far. Uh, thank you. I, I appreciate that you mentioned Russia and China and you talked about reforming multilateralism. Uh, I think these are important challenges that we'll talk about in the next hour. Uh, let me turn to um, Ambassador Fried. Uh, 
You've been Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs. You've actually dealt with previous transatlantic crisis. And I, I want to have your thoughts on how this compares to the, the moment we're living now. And if you're, uh, uh, I think you're a natural optimist about the relationship, but uh, where do we go from here? Um, there's plenty of gloom around. It's sort of the op-ed writing trope to talk about um, the West facing insurmountable obstacles on the way to inevitable disaster. But I'm, I'm old enough to remember the 1970s when things were also falling apart, and that was also the standard cliche. Um, look, the EU is a miracle, and a strong Europe is good, a strong EU is good for the US. And let's not forget that a strong Europe was supported from the beginning by the US if it wasn't our idea in the first place. Um, so the anti-Europe rhetoric from some parts of the Trump administration is ahistoric, it's nonsense. Um, we do have problems. The, the US risks falling back to its worst 20th century traditions of unilateralist transactional nationalism. Um, the EU has problems. Look, it, it, it's still sorting out issues of national sovereignty versus European level law and competence and authority. The German constitutional court ruling earlier this week is one example. Both of us, both the EU and Europe have problems we need to deal with. Um, I hope the coronavirus crisis scares us straight. Something needs to. We've heard in the last few minutes an, a sketch of a common agenda, and I could not agree more. Um, dealing with the pandemic, warding off its worst economic consequences, dealing with China, which we can do from a position of relative strength if we work together. The purpose isn't to isolate China, but make them respect, not game the common rules of the system. Deal with Russian aggression while investing in a better Russia. Um, there are there's a rich agenda out there, and it's no harder than the than the agenda we've already succeeded at over the past seventy and seventy five years. Um, the Biden administration, if it comes to that, um, may offer more possibilities, and it may be an easier political context. But honestly, much can be achieved and achieved working with the Trump administration, <clears throat> I'll acknowledge with more effort and distraction. And my last thought is, we've had, <clears throat> people have said so already and I agree, we've had a great run for 75 years. What, longest period of general European peace since Roman times? Absolutely right. Um, we understand that the system is in, is in rough shape, but it's still better than the competition. Democracy has staying power that astonishes its adversaries and often astonishes us ourselves. We can do this if we put our minds to it. Thank you, uh, Ambassador Fried. And I want to remind our viewers that you can ask questions by writing them in the Q&A box, or you can just tweet at us or write in, in, in Facebook comments. Uh, let me turn to Dr. Tosig. Uh, we, we've been talking about China and Russia. I know that's a, a core part of your of your scholarship, of your work on how the, the translating relationship can um, be an asset in pushing back against new authoritarian models. I want to hear you about this because obviously we've been talking a lot about, especially Chinese propaganda in in the, um, the midst of the response to uh, to COVID nineteen. How worried are you about this? But also, how can this be a, a, an opportunity going forward? First, thank you, Ben, for the invitation. I wish we could all be together in person and congratulations on the launch of your new initiative. And I look forward to seeing the work that you do over the next year. Uh, ben, you're, you're exactly right. Uh, not only is the transatlantic relationship facing a significant global pandemic and uh, imminent global financial and economic crisis, but there are these looming geopolitical crises in the background that await every decision maker who's currently dealing with trying to bolster health security and uh, rebuild economies. And it's been very interesting to see over the last few weeks, China's attempts to advance a propaganda and disinformation campaign throughout Europe. 
Uh, it, it's in many ways borrowing from the Kremlin's playbook. We're seeing the use of social media trolls, uh, the spreading of conspiracy theories by Chinese diplomats, uh, state official sources. We're seeing them amplified on state-friendly or state-sponsored media. And it's having a mixed effect in Europe. And I'll get to the broader strategic aspect of this in a moment, but just uh, situationally, we've seen on the one hand, national leaders like French President Macron uh, come out and say that the, the Europe bashing from China needs to end as it puts forward these narratives of, of weak European solidarity and highlighting uh, Chinese support for European economies over that of European support. Um, however, we've also seen the Chinese uh, be very capable of exerting influence to weaken, for example, an EU report on disinformation. Uh, we also saw there was an op-ed penned by 27 EU ambassadors uh, that was uh, that allowed itself to be censored and published in China Daily that didn't mention that the uh, coronavirus pandemic originated in China. And so we're seeing some of this influence have a reverberating uh, effect within Europe. And so it'll be interesting to see going forward to what extent Europe can uh, kind of bolster its own defenses in dealing with Chinese propaganda, Chinese information that we've really seen uh, more from the Russia side in recent years. But this, this begs the broader question about how uh, the United States and Europe can work together to counter Chinese influence, uh, economic coercion. And uh, as Ambassador Freed mentioned, yes, it would be better if we had uh, a, a stronger transatlantic relationship, but there's so much that Europe can do on its own to bolster its resilience vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. We've seen this new po uh, geopolitical commission that you referenced already taking significant steps like initiating the position of a chief trade, in, uh, trade enforcement officer, trying to strengthen its competition laws so that uh, Chinese companies aren't capable of of taking over or buying out uh, European industries and strategic uh, capacities. So we've seen a few important steps. However, on the weaker side, there are divisions within Europe dealing with China. Um, only half of European economies have investment screening mechanisms to deal with uh, Chinese economic coercion. There's deep divides over 5G and whether Huawei will be a uh, Chinese tech company allowed to build out some of this infrastructure and technology. And so I think this pandemic, just to bring it back to this current moment we're in, is highlighting a lot of those divisions. It's highlighting growing Chinese influence. It would be better if we had a stronger transatlantic relationship to deal with it, but we're seeing positive steps from the European Union, seeing positive steps from Europe, but there are a lot of divisions to overcome even internally to having a more geopolitical stance toward China. So this gives me a great segue to uh, lead to Dr. Bradford, who has written a book on uh, the EU's regulatory power, uh, the Brussels effect, and how the EU can assert normative power on the world stage through its its, its rules and, and standards. And, and this is what Dr. Tosig was alluding to, how, what the uh, the EU can do itself to uh, bolster its resilience beyond the transatlantic relationship. Uh, how You've written a, a really good piece this week, Dr. Bradford, on uh, how uh, the EU is actually navigating this, this crisis better than most of us think and, and will uh, might come out of this stronger, especially when it comes to its, its regulatory power. I'd love to hear you about this and, and what does it mean when it comes to the relationship with China that we just uh, talked about? Yeah, so thank you so much uh, for having me for this important conversation. Um, so the EU, um, the book that I wrote emphasizes what the EU can do alone. But I always describe the EU as a contingent unilateralist that is always open for multilateralism, open for partners and working together with governments and, and nations that share its values. Um, but the regulatory power that the EU has successfully leveraged over the past decades is something um, that has not been a geopolitical tool. It has been a tool that the EU has built to uh, build the, the single market and strengthen uh, the trade within the EU itself. But it has had a lot of influence outside of the EU's borders. Why I believe that regulatory power is not being sidelined uh, by the crisis is really because of its technocratic nature. So in many ways, the, the EU's regulatory power is somewhat insulated from the day-to-day 
political agendas, from the kind of storms, whether economic or political, that are um, shaping the agendas of the council, that are shaping the more uh, pressing political agendas. So if we think about, for instance, the general data protection regulation, that was not derailed because of the Brexit vote. It was not derailed because of the height of the migration crisis. So I do not see the EU slowing down on its ambition to shape the world, whether it is to pursue its goals when it comes to the protection of the environment, when it comes to shaping the digital environment in which we are trying to manage these various challenges that have been discussed uh, this morning as well. The EU will be going ahead with its Digital Services Act and, and making sure that the EU's values are reflected in that regulation. So I see some of those uh, elements of the EU's key power being somewhat shielded uh, from the, the, the biggest effects uh, of the crisis. How it then allows the, the EU to uh, deal with some of the challenges posed by China? And I think one of the concrete challenges is really the extent to which China has been pushing forward its digital authoritarian view of the world, how it has been exporting the kind of surveillance that leaves Europeans and frankly, Americans quite uncomfortable and how there has been demand by many authoritarian foreign governments um, who find the Chinese technology and approach here as a very effective tool to exert control in their societies. And this is, I think, where the transatlantic alliance comes into the picture. Yes, the US and the EU have had their differences when it comes to, for instance, regulating the digital economy. There is still more of a techno-libertarian view um, that, that prevails in many conversations uh, in the US and skepticism about the, the, the digital paternalistic view that the EU has been advocating. But I think the US and the EU share the view that the kind of disinformation campaign that has been leveraged through the social media, that the risk of um, interference into the elections, the extent to which the citizens can be surveilled uh, through these technologies, it is something that both are very uncomfortable. Um, and if you think about a recent example, how Americans and Europeans are working together, we have leading American companies, Google and Apple, developing technology to con to, towards contact tracing that would allow the societies to emerge from the lockdown safely. And they are incorporating European concerns of privacy very deeply into that technology. So I see a lot of reason, a lot of possibilities of success in the US and the EU working towards their goals jointly post-pandemic. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And I think you mentioned examples that have very concrete and direct impact on, on our daily lives. You know, the, what you talked about, privacy, the GDPR rules. I think everyone who's been logging on the website in the last couple of years has seen these, these European rules have an impact on the way American companies deal with, with privacy issues. I think this is really interesting. Let, let me turn back to, to Nathalie Loiseau, especially to focus on, on China. Uh, Dr. Tasig uh, uh, underlined some of the divisions and, and, and maybe ambiguities that we've heard uh, coming from Europe on, on the relationship with China in the last couple of weeks. Uh, you know, last year, the, the commission released a pretty strongly worded uh, paper, uh, white paper on the relationship with China calling China is a systemic rival, um, but at the same time, and we heard uh, Joseph Borrell, the high representative, also a few days ago, saying the Europeans had been naive when it comes to the relationship with China. But there's also this, this op-ed that was censured uh, by the 27 ambassadors that was mentioned. And obviously, a lot of divisions among member states with the 17 plus 1 framework with Central and Eastern European countries or uh, Italy uh, signing a memorandum of understanding with the Belt and Road Initiative uh, last year. Um, what do you think, you know, where, where do Europeans stand today? It's a large question, but on the relationship with, with China, what are the differences with the US? Because it, it seems from this side of the Atlantic that uh, Europeans have also been stepping up th their concerns and rhetoric uh, uh, with Beijing, but for some reason, we, we, don't, we still don't see eye to eye between the US and, and, and Europe. What's missing? 
Oh, well, you give me two hours to answer, right? <laughs> I think. Um, uh, China is the number one uh, issue uh, that uh, people are working on uh, in the European Union if we think about relations with the rest of the world. Uh, and it's mixed uh, situation, as you rightly mentioned. Um, for instance, in Italy, uh, at the very beginning of the uh, pandemic, uh, the EU was slow to react, uh, and that's a fact. And China did its, its propaganda uh, with its mask diplomacy, providing equipment uh, uh, and masks to Italy, uh, making more noise uh, than good. Uh, and it worked uh, because people were desperate. But at the same time, it backlashed at some point because of um, very uh, clumsy efforts of disinformation, uh, which basically shocked uh, a number of Europeans. And uh, when you mentioned this uh, story of an op-ed uh, written by the 27 ambassadors in Beijing and being censored by China Daily, the fact that someone uh, in the EU delegation accepted this censorship is creating uh, outrage in the European Union. And there will be consequences. And this is a very healthy debate that is taking place. Now, uh, why uh, is this uh, relation with China not offering more opportunities to work hand in hand with the United States as it should? Uh, probably because um, there is a um, uh, 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 fear uh, from the European side to be drawn uh, into um, a new sort of Cold War between China and, U and the United States, and maybe for domestic American political reasons. Nobody in Europe wants to take part in something that has to do with the uh, presidential election campaign in the United States. China is a serious issue. We have to deal it seriously, but we don't want to be dragged into something that would li look like um, fake intelligence reports. We all have the uh, memory of uh, 2003. Um, and when we hear that there is an amazing five eye reports uh, about uh, China and the Wuhan lab, we are more than uh, skeptical, or at least we are very cautious. Yeah. I think these are really important points uh, on on the U.S. attitude, and that's what I want to ask Ambassador Fried about. Uh, what could the U.S. do better to shape a transatlantic agenda on great power competition on China and, and Russia? As uh, Natalie Oiseau just mentioned, uh, there are uh, legitimate concerns on the European side with uh, siding with, with this administration. We've seen also just a lot of uh, uh, unhelpful noise in the transatlantic relationship on on tariffs, on uh, rhetoric that the EU is, is worse than China. I mean, what, what should be done to, to improve this climate? Well, the good news is, and this, con this conversation demonstrates it, there's a common agenda waiting to be captured and acted upon. And a common, ag a common approach to China is not all that hard to discern. It's going to take efforts on both sides. From the United States, we're going to have to understand that bashing China, being mad at China, and trying to isolate China are probably not achievable, and it will be difficult to enlist a transatlantic common policy on that basis. Um, but the Trump administration's most constructive tenant, if I can say so, is the notion of great power competition. And the conclusion should be for the Trump administration that we need to work with the great power closest to us, Europe, the better to deal with um, a great power adversary, which is China. So we're gonna have, the Americans are gonna have to moderate their ambitions. The purpose is to bring, is to get China to adhere to the rules-based system rather than game it. Europe is going to have to decide whether it will actually step up politically and strategically in a way commensurate with its strength. We've heard a lot of talk about Europe's power to shape events using its regulatory strength. I agree with that completely. 
um, both sides need to take a step forward. The United States in the direction of work of more achievable goals, Europe in the direction of actually recognizing and asserting its power. This is doable. Um, you know, in, in, in my day, it would have been the major achievement of a US-EU summit supplemented by US work with the major national capitals in Europe. This is doable. Um, it's not easy. But my sense is that Europe is moving in the direction of a stronger uh, relation, a stronger position vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, and I think it would be ready to meet the US halfway if we were going there. Yeah, and, and let me just ask you, Ambassador Free, the follow-up question because you mentioned the the rules-based order that Teddy Wazo and others talked about uh, multilateralism, but a different kind of multilateralism. We've seen uh, divisions over the uh, U.S. decision to defund the WHO, um, but what you know, what's also a positive agenda on on multilateralism going forward? I know this is something that you work uh, a lot on, and and sometimes even. Americans and Europeans who defend the liberal world order or defend multilateralism don't necessarily mean the same thing by it. So how do we prevent these, these yeah. misunderstandings? So multilateralism to an American ear sounds like, can sound like fatuous weakness and a desire to get along at the expense of substance. That's not what it means. It means using multilateral institutions um, to advance shared objectives. Um, you wrote, Ben, you wrote with Gerard de Rowe, um, who has been known to be a, a strong critic of some aspects of US political culture. You wrote, I think, a wonderful example of how to use multilateralism right. You and Gerard de Rowe talked about um, a strong transatlantic approach to the WTO, where we don't, the WHO, um, World Health Organization, where we don't try to trash it, but we try to get it to play at a higher level. And that was an example of tough-minded, clear-eyed multilateralism. Multilateralism doesn't mean simple process. It doesn't mean, um, it doesn't mean process over substance. It means using, it means building alliances to achieve shared objectives. Um, so that kind of a definition is workable. And the EU should understand, A, that it is strong, and B, that it, it has to use that strength if it's going to maintain itself in a difficult world and maintain a strategic alliance with the United States to deal with problems outside the transatlantic community. Oh, yeah, and the US is obviously going to have to stop tr picking fights with everybody all the time. Now, if we have a problem, an economic, if we face an economic challenge in China, we shouldn't be burning through our political capital with Europe by talking about car tariffs. Yeah. So tough-minded, clear-eyed multilateralism. Uh, I'm going to ask the same question, actually, to, to Tori Tosig. Uh, you know, there's going to be so much on the agenda to get out of this economic crisis. And obviously, we're seeing uh, the the, the risk of rising nationalism, of inward looking solutions. Um, there's so much to be done and what, yet we have divisions on WHO, on the WTO. I mean, how, how can the US reshape a, a positive agenda and, and reclaim a, a, an international uh, uh, narrative? Thanks, Ben. I wanted to dovetail off of Ambassador Freed's excellent comments and, and move the conversation from China to this positive transatlantic agenda that you've mentioned, because I think there are three things that need to happen in order to have a more coherent strategy toward China, but also just to, to look toward a more positive transatlantic agenda moving forward. Um, number one, this is more on the strategic level. First, I don't think we've seen the US pursue a fundamentally strategic relationship with Europe since the mid 1990s. And now, at least according to the US national uh, security apparatus, we are in this new geopolitical moment. Primary challenges facing the United States are revisionist authoritarian uh, states, including Russia and China. However, Europe 
strategically has fit into this paradigm as either a pawn of great power competition or an object of great power competition. It looks once again stuck in the middle of a looming and impending Cold War. I completely agree with uh, Dr. Loiseau. That's not uh, in Europe's interest and it's not uh, very conducive to getting a cooperative stance from Europe. So that's number one. We need to develop a strategic relationship with Europe that looks to strengthen Europe as an independent and geopolitical actor and not a pawn or an object between U.S.-China competition. I just think that's an inaccurate assessment of, of Europe's uh, geoeconomic and soft power in the world today. Number two, and Ambassador Fried mentioned this, in order to advance a a positive transatlantic agenda, we need to reset this, this relationship first. That means uh, taking a very hard look at some of the tariffs uh, and economic rhetoric that the Trump administration has been putting forward. The Section 232 tariffs on steel and aluminum saying that uh, imports from our European allies threaten our national security. That's not conducive to coming up with a cooperative economic agenda toward China or on any other front uh, as we look to advance uh, trade agreements, trade processes with the European Union moving forward. Same with the auto tariffs conversation. And then thirdly, and I know multilateral has been mentioned, multilateralism has been mentioned both negatively and positively uh, thus far, but and this is this will come as no shock to anyone, but I think it, it requires the United States first rejoining the Paris Climate Accord so that Europe is not looking towards China as its preeminent partner on the world stage for, for big uh, geopolitical security challenges of the future like climate. It will mean kind of cooperatively and substantively working with the Europeans, working with the Japanese at the WTO instead of bashing the WTO, to address shared grievances on China, whether that be IP theft or trade subsidies. I mean, the, the grievances are there, but it requires a, a reset at the strategic level, at the economic level, and then also rejoining at the multilateral level that uh, at institutions where America has concrete interests. And only at that stage could you start to develop a more positive transatlantic agenda moving forward, whether that be on China or any other issue. Thanks. That, that's terrific. And I love the idea. And I've, I've you know, we've, we've done some work on this on strengthening the, the Europe as a, as its own aut autonomous actor, as, as an asset for the transatlantic relationship. And I, we have a, a, a few questions already. Let me uh, finish this this round with with Dr. Bradford, and then we can turn to to some of the questions. Asking you the same thing: How can we moving forward, especially out of this crisis, shape this this positive transatlantic agenda? So I think multilateralism and engagement in international institutions is a traditional strength of the European Union. But I think the EU and the US as well need to be more strategic and more creative in how to find productive ways to engage in bilaterally, regionally, and multilaterally. So there are certain international organizations which just need to be prioritized and where the agendas can uh, be very similar between the US and the EU. One is the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, where the China has managed to become a leading voice and where the US and the EU would need to push back and make sure that their values will be reflected on the agendas when it comes to the governance of the internet. We also may need to rethink some of the agendas that have been multilateral. So if we think about the risks over NATO and national security, I think this pandemic invites us to rethink our joint national security interests, go beyond the traditional NATO agendas and see global pandemics, migration, climate change through the lens of national security and put those on the top of uh, ways where the US and the EU can work uh, closely together. And we also may need to think about the multilateral cooperation in, in rethinking the specific alliances that we have. And when the EU works with the United States, the United States is not just the White House. There are other branches to the government. It is a federalist uh, state where we think about ways to work with the governors, to work with the mayors, I think climate change is one of the uh, areas where if the United States decides that it walks away from the Paris deal, that doesn't mean that all the constituencies within the United States would have given up on an agenda where they can work together with the European Union. Yeah, you've actually answered one of the questions that we had precisely about this. 
as uh, the you know we've seen Europeans reach out to to mayors, to governors, to uh, uh, private corporations to uh, uh, work on, on on climate change after uh, the the administration decided to withdraw from the uh, Paris Climate Agreement. That could be a new creative way forward, also for the transatlantic relationship beyond just uh, government to government relations. And I think it's a really interesting example. We've had a few questions actually on the key issue uh, that's been raised a lot these last few years and these last few weeks and in the wake of the pandemic, which is democratic backsliding in, in Europe. There's been the example of Hungary that's been uh, mentioned a lot, but, but also Poland. Um, Hungary that was uh, a few days ago um, mentioned, declared as a, not a democracy anymore by uh, the NGO Freedom House. I know a lot of you have been actually working on these issues, so let me do a, a, a round a round table with first uh, Nathalie Loiseau and then Ambassador Fried uh, for both a, a European and a transatlantic perspective. What what should be done and how should that be part of the agenda? Uh, that's extremely important uh, because the European Union is not simply a single market and especially uh, countries from Eastern Europe uh, didn't come to European Union uh, to join a single market. They, they came because they wanted to get rid of dictatorships. They wanted to make sure that freedoms, uh, that rule of law would be protected. So we have a rule and this is where we need a stronger Europe. For the time being, the treaties, the text that we have, don't provide us with much uh, leverage uh, to force uh, the uh, member states who uh, are drifting away from the rule of law to get back to normal. But there are ways, uh, uh, if we don't convince uh, governments uh, with ideas and values, we can convince them with money. That is to say that for the time being, we are working on the next European budget for the uh, coming uh, seven years. And there should be a conditionality uh, for uh, getting European money, which is to respect the rule of law very simply. But you're right, this is another pandemic uh, taking advantage of the current situation. And for instance, you were mentioning Hungary. Hungary suspended its uh, parliament and uh, g g gave extraordinary powers to the prime minister and decisions taken uh, thanks to these extraordinary powers have very little to do with the pandemic. It, it came to grant uh, a, a railway between uh, Serbia and Hungary to a Chinese company or to get out of the Istanbul Convention uh, fighting uh, violences against women. So it's really serious. It's really taking place. And uh, once again, we would like Washington to stop playing games with uh, the most liberal of our leaders in Europe, because if you name them, it's Poland, it's Hungary, and now it's Slovenia. And Donald Trump only had nice words uh, towards these uh, illiberal leaders. Ambassador Freed, you, you uh, co-authored a, uh, a piece recently with uh, associate fellow uh, Denise for Stuber, sort of uh, writing a, a roadmap for, for U.S. policymakers on how to engage this situation. Yeah, um, we need, as we're thinking about um, Hungary, for example, and I'm thinking of the Freedom House report earlier this week, we need to distinguish between issues of democracy and larger and broader political issues. We can't politicize our concerns and make it appear as if democracy and socially liberal are the same thing, because they're not. We have to understand that electorates may vote in a conservative direction a culturally conservative direction, we have to respect that. But then we, we have to be careful about drawing a line, but then we have to respect that line. Um, one of the tools may be for the EU to use its budgetary process. That's beyond my area of specialty. But we also ought to reach out, um, we non-governments, the Atlantic Council, others, ought to reach out to the broader society in Hungary. Um, there is civil society, there are NGOs. We should not leave, we should not isolate the countries or let them um, think that we're going to hide behind cliches or just be angry. We need to reach out to them and think of a long game. 
none of this is easy. And God knows the United States is dealing with issues itself. Um, I'll just put it that way. But we do have options if we play this carefully. Yeah. Let me turn also to Dr. Tosig, who has written about this, and especially in, I think, the broader ideological context, context of, uh, of the rise of neo-authoritarian models. Thanks, Ben. I, I, I agree. I think what we're seeing in Hungary with response to the coronavirus pandemic has highlighted the democratic backsliding we've seen under the Orban government in recent years. We also had this back and forth debate in Poland over the last few weeks about whether or not to hold presidential elections this coming weekend. And it was decided recently, I think yesterday or the day before, that these elections would be put off. Um, until that point, it, it kind of looked like a power grab by the governing law and justice party to move forward with unsafe elections so that a, a presidential incumbent, incumbent in favor could, could move forward and win the next election. There have also been unprecedented uh, suppressions of civil liberties I mean, in countries around the world to deal with this global health crisis. So a big question, not just in places like places of concern like Poland and Hungary, but also elsewhere moving forward is how we reduce these uh, infringements on civil liberties as we kind of move out of this, this global health crisis. How do we ensure that democratic processes remain in place and that societies are able to function again and freely uh, when these emergency measures are lifted. Uh, I, I would say looking at an agenda moving forward, one way that the United States can work very closely with European allies is on developing and enacting a tough anti-corruption agenda. This was a big, just to get political for a moment, this was a, a big component of Liz Warren's presidential uh, campaign and foreign policy platform. It's, a, it's an important component of the democratic platform moving forward. I think there's a lot of interest, but also understanding that these neo-authoritarian leaders were corrupt before they were anti-democratic and that they rely on kleptocratic networks to remain in power. And so to the extent that the US can work with European allies to shut down illicit tax havens, to deal with tax evasion, to go after these corrupt networks that are being um, exploited by Russian malign influence, exploited by Chinese economic coercion. I think this is both in the interest of the US and Europe, and there is a significant platform for advancing this going forward. But I think first and foremost, this, this pandemic has, has really illustrated the ways in which anti-democratic governments are yeah. latching on to this health security crisis for their own benefit. Yeah. And a positive agenda on anti-corruption measures. I think that's uh, a, a great way to, to conclude with Dr. Bradford uh, on, on what, how, what role the EU could, could, uh, could play uh, in, 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 um, in shaping such an agenda. Yeah, so first of all, the EU, uh, by tolerating anything that is happening in countries like Hungary, and Poland, the EU is not only weakening uh, its own uh, standing uh, in front of its own citizens in the EU, but also its global normative power and the appeal of its values and its credibility to promote its values, rule of law, uh, democratic principles around the world. So the stakes are extremely high and it's important that whatever happens in countries like Hungary right now are unambiguously condemned in the political, by the political leadership in the EU. But I also would add um, that judicially, that we will have continue to bring these countries to the court. And we have the European Court of Justice uh, very clearly articulate why um, whatever these measures uh, these countries have pursued are inconsistent with the European treaties and European values. I also would add that um, the political parties in the European Parliament, the European People's Party, should not tolerate parties like Fidesz uh, on, uh, in its midst. Um, so the Europe needs to be very clear in distancing itself uh, from the kind of policies that are fundamentally against the foundational values of the European Union. And only then uh, the EU can reclaim its place in an international conversation, in effectively promoting these values and also making sure, like uh, Tori was saying, this is a global phenomenon. We have a rise in authoritarian governments around the world. So uh, the EU is worried not only of what happens in the EU, but what happens around the world. 
Thank you. I'd like to thank all four of you for this terrific conversation and everyone who joined today. Uh, we're going to continue uh, these exchanges in the next few months, uh, this, this new series, USCU at 70, to have these, these frank conversation about how we can together shape a positive agenda to get out of this pandemic, to get out of this economic crisis and, and reshape a, a liberal border, uh, border to, together. Thank you so much. Stay safe. Have a nice weekend. And, and uh, I hope to see all of you very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much.